Welcome to another episode of Oversharing. Our guest today is an innovative thought leader, early adopter, and a disruptor in all things consumer brands. Where others see challenges and hardships, he sees an opportunity to innovate, disrupt, and accelerate new ideas. With passions and expertise in health and wellness, food and beverage, technology, and the millennial consumer, Alex had the opportunity to consult, lead teams, and launch businesses within the food and be be uh, beverage industries. He's currently the CEO of the wild success, wildly successful cold brew coffee company, Busy Coffee, which has been featured in BuzzFeed, Fox News, Refine29, and more, and has even reached the number one bestseller list on Amazon. But before I speak too much, let's allow Alex French to overshare. How are you doing, Alex? Oh, I'm doing so good on this wonderful Wednesday here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Yeah, you're working kind of late. Well, I guess it's 5.15, but I feel like these days nobody's really working after 11. They're kind of they're kind of pretending, but you guys have been pretty busy lately, right? Yeah, we've been really busy. We're actually coming at you live from the factory that we have here in, in Minneapolis. So we've been getting in early. You know, we had a 7 a.m. meeting and uh, we've been pretty much staying here until 7 or 8 every day. So um, you know, it's, it's been a lot of fun, actually. That's awesome, man. I'm really excited to dig into uh, a little bit more about a Busy Coffee, but I don't know if you know this, but I start every podcast with uh, what were you like in high school? Yeah, um, you know, it's kind of a, a, a fun story. So myself, I was, uh, you know, like a chameleon. As the entrepreneur, you feel like you never really fit in. So I was uh, kind of a total math science nerd taking AP classes um, also, you know, played lacrosse was kind of, uh, on the lacrosse team. So a little bit of, little bit of athletics, um, and then total curveball was, um, a big time, like snowboarder action sports guy. So this really weird mix of, uh, kind of nerdy athletic and extreme risk-taking grungy kind of type of guy. So I got along with everyone, but fit in with no one. <laughs> well, it it wasn't very often that I ran into people that were like the math, the math person and also the crazy extreme sports person. So definitely unique there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think that it's the extreme sports is, has helped dramatically in the world of entrepreneurship. Cause at the end of the day, you know, it's so risky um, that you, you just have to be comfortable with risk. And then I think I had that nice kind of balance of, of the math mind to, to calculate the risk, mm. uh, but still had kind of the courage to go ahead and, and take it. Did I read somewhere that you're also an Ironman participant as well? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, my co-founder and I are both kind of crazy uh, endurance athletes. So we've done several ultra endurance uh, races. We've done, uh, there's this thing called the world's toughest mutter, which is a 24 hour race. Uh, we've done some ultra marathons. We did Ironman in 2018. Uh, it's kind of part of our company culture. We actually have a guy, Mark, who just did um, this thing called the Calendar Club, where he ran a mile for every day of the of the month. So on on uh, April 30th, he ran 30 miles. On the 29th, he ran 29 miles. So uh, yeah, it's kind of just part of our culture of just you know continually getting better and, and going the extra mile. That's uh... That's actually really inspiring. I'm big on like on definitely staying active and getting fit. But definitely, once you said 30 miles and I started putting that together, I was like, eh, that's that's not the one for me. I'm good at three miles. Yeah, it was a bit much for me too. I think he's, uh, you know, he's inspired by us to do those things, and he went ab above and beyond to to put it nicely. So you mentioned that you had like a little bit of an entrepreneurial mindset when you were in high school already. Were you already thinking about starting businesses or interested in that life at that time? Yeah, I think really ever since I was probably in elementary school. Um, so I don't come from a family of entrepreneurs. I didn't really know what entrepreneurship was. Um, I had your typical, you know, I was a kid that had the, you know, Lamborghini Countach on the wall. And I, and I remember going to my dad and I was like, I, I want to get one of those. How do I, how do I get that? And like, oh, you got to be a business owner, son. And so that had, had kind of always been my North star. Uh, and then really kind of through middle school, um, high school, I had just always been hustling of some kind, typical, you know, lawn mowing business, mm. shoveling. Um, I had even been buying and selling Beanie Babies and action figures. So just kind of always doing some sort of, of hustle. Uh, and it's just kind of continually snowballed from there. The Beanie Babies was a big one. Were you going to like McDonald's too and getting those toys and selling them to your friends? 
Oh, doing it all, going to the toy stores. And my mom was a trooper. She'd just drive me all around and, you know, help me find the best ones. And then we'd go to like the conventions and the swap meets and, and sell them kind of in that supply and demand uh, market. So yeah, we, we did, we did all of it. We knew which ones were of value, which ones weren't and, and just kind of went, went crazy with it. Gotcha. So before you started Busy Coffee, you had two companies before that, but even before that you were working at General Mills. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience there? Yeah, honestly, it was it was fantastic. Um, I got a really good uh, crash course into, you know, what they call CPG, which is consumer packaged goods, which would then ultimately be probably the industry that I, you know, will stay with my career for the life of it. But, you know, I was working with extremely intelligent people. I was on the marketing team there. I had the only role in marketing that you can have without having an MBA. So I was very fortunate to be surrounded by very, very hardworking, very intelligent people. And that really lifted me up and it helped me learn and, and work with MBAs to see what level of caliber people are expecting from you and, and how to be the best. And, you know, that really shaped a lot of my uh, kind of career and gut instincts. I had always been really into learning about consumers and trying to understand how people worked. But I was very fortunate that the woman that sat next to me, her job was actually in this thing called consumer insights. And so it was a, a job function and I got to shadow her and go to meetings with her and get her access to things. Uh, and so I was able to just do a ton of, of research and, and learn so much about the consumer and how to get that information. Uh, and that was probably the biggest thing that, um, that I got, that I got. To. You just clicked mute real quick. Oh yeah. Sorry. No worries. Um, no, that's a, that's, that's amazing. And I know that played into your decision to start busy, co uh, uh, busy coffee. But before that too, there was lifty the, uh, the snowboarding accessory, right? Were you still working at general mills when you were, when you started developing that product? No. So prior to general mills, I was actually uh, at Best Buy and I had started it there with my current uh, business partner and roommate. Uh, we were really just kind of tinkering, looking for something. He's a, he's a mechanical engineer. And so we were just making things for fun. And um, we came up with this little device. We were just looking for something to do after working hours. Uh, and so at that time I was at, at Best Buy, but through that had really fallen in love with the branding marketing side of it. And then that took me over to General Mills and that business unfortunately was not successful through a multitude of reasons. Um, so we shut that one down and then kind of moved on to the next idea. Yeah. And this device was to help you get off the lift without like breaking an ankle, right? Yeah, it was to, it was more for being on the chair lifts because you spend quite a bit of time on it in some cases. And so it was to distribute the weight of the snowboard between both feet, which is a legitimate problem, but not one that people are premeditating or willing to spend against. Um, so yeah, that one ended up not working for us. Then you had another business, which was like an outdoor fitness company as well. Um, you mentioned in our like preliminary conversation that this is, it wasn't something that was scalable. Um, when did the idea of creating a scalable business become interesting to you? Uh, you know, was it within that development or were you initially planning on having this outdoor fitness business be scalable as well? Yeah. So the biggest learning, you know, I learned that in Lifty is we had gotten some customers, um, but it was, it was very transactional as a one-time use item. And so that got me thinking about, okay, you know, if you're going to have to acquire, so snowboarding is already one market, and then you have an even smaller market of people that are willing to purchase this item to solve this problem. And they only buy it once. So it's, it's a small business that can't scale very large. And I just realized that. Um, within um, the act or the group fitness business, it really was just purely a passion. It kind of turned into a business. It wasn't even started to become one. Mm. Um, we basically had a bunch of friends that were that we convinced to do this tough mutter race and said that we'd train them, and we did it out at a park, and we did it in like a very busy. Uh, it's called Lake Calhoun in Minneapolis. It's a very, very, very heavily foot trafficked area. And people just started joining us. And next thing we know, we'd have 50 to 100 people at these workouts. And we did kind of a pay what you want model. 
And we've always been of the kind of camp that if you're going to do something, do it well and be very proud of it. And so we started putting in a ton of time and we made some decent money. Um, but with the amount of time we were putting in, it was just taking away from everything else you want to do in life. And we said, okay, there's a business here, but we're putting in so much time. If we decide like it just can't scale because these people are here for us. Mm -hmm. And then it, it just kind of reinforced that idea of, I want to build something long-term that can scale and, and, I really liked the idea of teaching people and adding value to their lives, but we could only do it on a small scale. So it's moving forward now with the rest of my businesses and ideas. It's always thinking about adding value in the biggest, most scalable way. I love that. Um, not business related, but what goes into Tough Mudder training? I've only heard of it, never looked into it. You know, we did all sorts of crazy stuff because we wanted, we, like, as I said, we were doing it more or less for fun than for free. So we would do a ton of, we would basically, we would always have a, it was a lake and it's pretty much a circle. So we would do like out and back runs and then we'd come back and we'd do like partner wheelbarrows and we'd do like <laughs> wheelbarrow races. And then we'd have people like jump on their backs and do partner squats. And we'd do all this like team kind of fun stuff because that's a whole big thing with Tough Mudder is you have to climb walls and you have to get help from strangers and you have to help strangers. And so we wanted to like make people comfortable with each other. Um, so it was just a lot of core, a little bit of medium sprints um, and then like some push-ups and crawling stuff. It sounds like a lot of fun, actually. Probably a good team building event for Blue Light. I should check that out. Um, yeah, it was great. <laughs> while you were developing uh, Busy Coffee, you mentioned that you dug into the data before deciding to scale the business to where it is today. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think so. We had kind of shut down. Uh, it was called He Man, She Can Team Fitness. And we were looking for something to do. Um, Andrew and I, roommates, we'd basically work our separate jobs, come back, and then just start ideating and it's like okay you can only work out for so long after work not super huge on television um so it's like what's that thing um that we can do in, in the beginning was like passive income that we can we liked our jobs he was as an, he was an engineer and in r d engineering at saint jude which is now abbott so a really cool job i was working in venture capital at general mills and so we were looking for something that could provide passive income that was going to be fun and easy and something that we liked. So we were just looking at a bajillion categories. We're, we're big time beer drinkers and we we're big time cold brew coffee drinkers. So it's like, all right, logically look at those two things. And at the time, this was in 2014, uh, we just went to Google trends because that's like the simplest way to do research on an idea. And it was just absolutely booming. So we knew that there was a ton of search volume for cold brew coffee. And then, you know, we went to layer deeper and looked at the keywords that were driving into that. And it's how to make cold brew coffee, cold brew coffee recipe, cold brew coffee ratio, cold brew coffee maker. And we saw that there was just this massive amount of search traffic coming in. And, you know, I'm a firm believer, especially after doing all these consumer insights studies professionally, is that... Um, people vote with their dollars. And so if people are searching for how to make cold brew coffee and cold brew coffee beans and, and cold brew coffee, ground coffee, et cetera, um, they're looking for that and they're looking to pay for it. And so whenever we're looking at ideas, it's, it's those things. And so some of them have transaction value. Some of them just have research value. And so we had looked at a ton of different categories and we had identified that cold brew coffee was going to be a very large, long-term trend. It kept getting bigger every single year. And then we kind of just talked to some friends and we're like, okay, well, why do you drink it? Why do you drink it? Okay, well, it replaced my energy drink or like, I just don't like hot coffee. And so we did a ton of quantitative data just through simple free things, which is again, Google keywords, um, Amazon search traffic and Google trends to find just macro ideas. And then we kind of took it a layer deeper. I was search, certainly very fortunate because I was at General Mills. I had access to this thing called Nielsen. So basically, whenever someone buys a product at a grocery store, that grocery store sells that sales data to this company called Nielsen, and then they aggregate it. So you can basically, I had access to this data that showed every single product category, how fast it was selling, how many units, what brands, 
what specific item was it sold at Target or Walmart and who was over indexing. So I had all this data. And again, I was a math nerd. And so I would just go crazy with it and stare at all these numbers and try and find some insights. And everything just kept pointing to fewer ingredients, lower sugar, craft, mm. custom, create yourself, delicious, um, you know, and higher caffeine was becoming a thing. So all of these macro trends that I was seeing across all categories kind of pointed to cold brew coffee. And I could tell through Google Trends that there was going to be a, a large search traffic every single summer. And the cool thing is, if you look at it, you can see that it's very seasonal, but it's becoming less and less seasonal every year. So mm -hmm. I had identified that it's, it, this isn't just like a summer thing. This is eating into the $15 billion coffee category. And so we kind of deduce that, all right, we think that there's a big opportunity here. And um, with kind of my marketing sales background, finance and Andrew's production ma uh, manufacturing, we thought, all right, we can probably make a really quality product. Uh, and so that was kind of the initial impetus to it. Busy Coffee wasn't the first name though, right? What was the first name of it again? No, no. The first name was Cause Coffee. So I, again, one of the, the major things that I learned within General Mills early on is there's this thing called a brand champion. And so you want to have this person that you build your brand for that's very specific. Now, they may not be your largest customer or target market segment, but they're the ones that you just build your brand for. And so I was so deep into the world of self-help entrepreneurship, listening to the podcast, reading the books, so the 4-Hour Workweek, Entrepreneur on Fire in 2004. 14, 15 was a daily podcast. Uh, and that got me so excited. And I thought to myself, um, there's this very clear audience to target that is interested in motivation and self-help. And so we actually launched a brand initially called Cause Coffee. And the mission of it was to basically help entrepreneurs and fuel them to fuel their cause, whatever that cause may be. Uh, again, this was right when Tom Shoes uh, became a, a huge brand and that, that social entrepreneurship movement was really big and we wanted to be the coffee brand for them. Um, so that was the initial brand. We went for the trademark and then instantly got a cease and assist letter from a water brand called My Cause Water. Mm. And that kind of made us double think uh, everything. But yeah, the initial brand was really targeted towards, you know, entrepreneurs um, on, on the internet. What about where, where would you say busy coffee is targeted toward to be targeted to now? Because even just the name busy coffee, like, yeah, that makes sense for like entrepreneurs as obviously busy people, that type of thing is, mm -hmm. do you have the same brand champion as you did for costs? You know, that's candidly been a very difficult challenge as we've gotten deeper and more into um, grocery retail. It's, it's, you have to have kind of all season tires. And so we're actually in the process of finishing up that exercise this week, actually, where we're redefining who that brand champion is. Uh, it's very easy to do um, on the internet or in a niche product category. But coffee, as we've learned, as we've gotten into it, is appeals to almost everyone in the country and it appeals to them for different reasons. And within the segment of coffee that we're in, in the grocery store with our um, 48 ounce bottles that are refrigerated, there's very limited shelf space. Mm -hmm. And so if you niche down too much, the grocery buyer won't even accept your product because it may not appeal to their massive consumer demographic. So um, as we push further, we're actually launching our website in June with a product line we will get back to that brand champion. We've been working on that extensively, um, but we've certainly been doing some soul searching after we had to change the name uh, and realize kind of the challenges of grocery retail. Mm -hmm. Now, you're, are you currently a number one bestseller on Amazon? We are, yep. That's amazing. What was your strategy to, to get there? We have a pretty specific one. Um, so what we know is that people in the food and beverage space, they want the best tasting product at the lowest price. Um, as I kind of mentioned, we know that people are searching for cold brew coffee, right? It's a huge thing we were able to identify on Google Trends. 
we had previously sold a liquid product on Amazon. We launched it in 2016. We still have it today. Um, but we started with what's called shelf stable, which means it doesn't need refrigeration. It was a shelf stable um, cold brew coffee concentrate. And we had a great brand. People loved the product, but we weren't number one uh, in the category. And we were just scratching our heads like, why don't we have this badge? And we did a bunch of consumer learning and basically looked at all of the products that sell in our category. You can, it's very simple now, you can just click the bottom of a profile and it says what number seller they are in their category. Mm. And we looked and we saw that in iced coffee and cold brew, the best seller was a bag of coffee. Mm. And, we, and we said to ourselves, all right, we, we've done all this extensive research on perfecting our blend to then turn into a liquid that we know we have a better tasting product than they do. Um, and we already had a liquid product in market. So we basically said, we have this supply chain built. We're already buying, we buy what's called the super sack. So it's like an 800 pound sack of coffee. And we said, well, we're buying this product. Let's just have our supplier put it into a one pound bag. So we basically looked at what our competitor was selling. We looked at what their price was. And um, we made the same thing, essentially. It was a one pound bag. And then um, kind of our launch strategy, if you will, is we put the product up on where um, FBA or Seller Central. So we own the inventory and ship it and pay a commission to Amazon. Um, we basically looked at what the competitor was doing, what, where they were priced at. And then um, we launched it. We had all of our friends and family buy it, leave five star reviews, which you're technically not supposed to do, but everyone does. Um, to make sure that we had a good base, you want to have best case scenario, 25 reviews, you know, one four star in there or whatever. So it looks real um, of your products before you start doing any marketing behind it. Mm. As consumers, none of us want to buy something unless there's reviews and it looks like it's a real product. So we got started with that. And then we honestly just blitzed the ad strategy as much as we could. So we, we had already been doing some ads. So we kind of knew a little bit on how to do it. But our approach was... Um, our pro, I think our competitor was at maybe 1399 as their price or 1499. We came in at 1299. We were not making any money on a per unit basis and we advertised like crazy. So again, for us, our product is seasonal and right at about, um, late April, early May, the search traffic just absolutely goes through the roof. So what we did is we did um, display ads, banner ads on the top, and we showed our product. And then we also showed the liquid. So it let people know that, hey, we specialize in cold brew coffee. Mm -hmm. This is what we do. We make liquids and we sell our grounds that we use to make our liquids. And our liquids had, I think, maybe 200, 250 reviews at the time. And our grounds had, you know, 25 more or less fake reviews. And um, so we did, we hammered the banner ads on the top and we showed our products and you can have a message. So we probably said something like, um, great taste, great price, something like that. And then we would um, also do the product, um, sponsored product PPC ad. So if someone searched cold brew coffee, they'd see our product on the top and they'd say, great taste, great price. And they'd see that we have one liquid with hundreds of reviews. And then they would scroll down and they would see our product again. And then, and then we also did um, product to display ads. So if someone was already buying our competitor or searching for our competitor, we'd show up on their page. Mm -hmm. And so we just did that. We undercut them on price. And then we just made sure that we were there whenever anyone searched for a cold brew or a cold brew coffee or a cold brew coffee maker, we were going to be there. And um, over time, our sales rate went up and our ranking went up and we optimized our page um, and then we just kept raising our prices and then we started, we started selling more. So our cost of goods was decreased so we could spend even more on ads. And then we just kept raising our price. And now we're at a 14 99 for a one pound bag. We have, I don't know, maybe 1300 reviews and we've maintained that number one bestseller ranking for, uh, next in June, it'll be two years. Exactly. Wow. That's awesome. Congratulations, man. Thank you. So what you just explained, first of all, thank you for sharing all that. That's probably more detail than anybody's ever given the listener. Um, so thank you. But from your lens, uh, 
how important is that initial branding and positioning um, in like a product success, right? Like, do you think you could have done that with any label, with any name, or was there something to the logo and the brand that you developed as well? I think naming is really important. Um, I'm kind of a firm believer in that the name of a brand should either talk about the problem or explain a solution to what someone's looking for. So that's kind of just a personal belief. I think the name's got to be catchy. It's got to be emotional. Um, and then I, I do also believe that within my industry, food and bev, things are slightly different and more complicated because um, there's taste involved. But at the end of the day, people want the best price, no matter what it is, right? If there's two items that have the same product features, they're almost always going to choose the one that's at the lowest price. So I think there certainly was a little bit of that in there. We had been on Amazon for two years, so we had built up a base. We had built up some good keyword ranking. Um, but I think that if I were to start from zero and do it again, I think that we'd be able to do it. And it's going to be a pricing strategy, a packaging size strategy, um, and then making sure the reviews are good. But at the end of the day, you still have to have a great product because if, if you, once you start getting real reviews and they're one, two, three stars, it's not going to work. So mm. I think there's a lot of things that come into play, but certainly name is important. Um, I don't think, I think you can, you can't sell through a terrible name, but you can sell through a medium name for sure. <laughs> a med I like that. A, a medium name. <laughs> yeah. An average, well, an average name. Yeah. So there's a lot of companies right now that had, uh, you know, definitely in consumer package goods that had a lot of, you know, most of their business is happening through retail. Obviously everything around COVID-19, they had to uh, maybe shift that strategy a little bit, get away from retailers or they lost a lot of um, retail sales there. And now they're finally making the transition into e-commerce and Amazon. What are your top three tactics for the tactics or strategies for somebody who's just starting to get their product in Amazon now and making that shift from like traditional retail to e-com? Yeah, I think if you, if you're making the shift from retail to e-com, you already have a brand, you already have a product. Um, I think the, the primary things that you need to do is, you know, it's, it's a new sales channel. It's a new sales strategy. You have to do ads. And it's unfortunate that it has become a pay to play game. Like if you go on Amazon and the top above the fold. So before you guys scroll down on your computer, there's, there's, I think there's seven slots and only two of them are unpaid. So it, it is a pay to play game. So number one is like, of course, make sure your profile looks delicious. It's beautiful. Um, you have all the information, you do all the A plus, you have all the right keywords. Um, but then you really got to just start, start the ad game. Of course, make sure you have the reviews as I've kind of mentioned, make sure you have reviews, make sure your profile looks beautiful with great photography, especially retail CPG. It's consumable. It has a taste to it, make it look tasty and then turn on those ads. And what we recommend, um, brands to do is start with an auto PPC campaign. And basically what that does is Amazon will put your product on lots of different pages and lots of different keywords, run that for a week. And then you can download the report and you can actually see one where they place your product onto competitors products or just other related products. And then two, just on keywords. And then you can start to learn, okay, like let's say you sell a, a string cheese for example, you could say like, all right, people like, um, stretchy cheese or, you know, whatever, not, nut free dairy, who knows what the is. That's a terrible example, but, um, you can identify what these keywords that are converting the highest. And then you basically pull those out and create separate campaigns. And then you just bid on those words exclusively. Um, but ads are one thing that if you want to be successful on Amazon, you have to pay to play and just make sure that you're monitoring them, adjusting your bids and, um, and then looking at them as, as often as you possibly can. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> I was like string cheese. That was an interesting pull mozzarella versus cheddar, but I don't even yeah. think cheddar strings very well. 
No, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, you know, when we first talked before we did the recording and then actually even this, uh, even in this podcast, you mentioned the four hour work week. Um, I think a lot of the listeners have uh, read that book as well. I'm personally a big Tim Ferriss fan also. Um, but, you've reached a lot of success, right? And even today you're working kind of late. Was there ever a time uh, after reading that book that you actually achieved a four hour work week and sustained it for like more than a week? No, I, I mean, I've never even come close to that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, you know, I think what it got me to do is think about the possibilities and it, it really allowed us to feel that it was acceptable to go hire a virtual assistant to just like, try stuff. I mean, I remember right out of the gates, we like, I remember thinking like, Oh, I couldn't email that person. Cause like, they're not going to respond or like, this feels so crazy to like send this email to this person. And so I could be like, well, I'll just have my virtual assistant do it. And then I didn't have like the fear of me getting rejected. It was like, they were, and it was totally fine. Um, but I, I think we also didn't like when we did the lifty, our plan was to patent it and then license it out to a Burton or some other manufacturer. And, you know, I, we just weren't successful. Uh, I still think that there's a, you can do that and it's just a lifestyle business. I'm at the point now where we've raised a lot of capital from investors and I could never do that. I would get fired as my mm -hmm. job. I think that it is, 100% achievable. And I have friends that have done it very successfully. Um, but their businesses are going to be smaller. They're not going to be, you know, have a $50 million exit someday, but they'll, they could make half a million to a million dollars in, you know, in income. And that's a beautiful life. Yeah. Um, I just, because of the path that I've taken, I'm unable to do that. I could see me doing that on the next one. Yeah. <laughs> and, I know, and I know how to do it now, but in my current uh, history, I have not been able to get anywhere close to that. That's funny. Uh, I actually, I listened to like an interview with uh, Tim Ferriss recently, and I think he even mentioned, because somebody brought that up, like, you can't even do a four-hour week, work week. And he's like, it wasn't actually about a four-hour work week. It was about opening up the possibilities. So very similar to what you said. So mm -hmm. um, I find that really interesting. Um, Alex, thank you so much for sharing as much as you did uh, today. Uh, before I ask the last question of today, though, um, if somebody wants to connect with you, where can they find you? Yeah, um, definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. Alex, I think I'm Alex J. French, uh, backslash that sort of thing. Um, I'm Alexander James French on Instagram. Um, otherwise, of course, you know, check out at Busy Coffee. Um, that's where you'll see most of the stuff that we put out and uh, would love a follow uh, if, if you're interested. Definitely check us out on Amazon. Get, give it a shot. See what, the best, see what the best tasting cold brew in America tastes like. <laughs> I love that. That was the strongest plug ever. Um, all right. Last question of the day. You mentioned that uh, in our preliminary conversation, you mentioned that uh, Lifty, maybe one of the reasons that it failed was because it wasn't something that snowboarders wanted to put on their, on their, on their board. It didn't look cool enough. Be honest. Do you use a Lifty today? You know, what's funny is I haven't snowboarded in probably three years, but you better believe it's on my snowboard. And when I do go, I do use it. So that for reference, that business failed in 2013. And so I probably haven't snowboarded in three years, but leading up to it, I just, I still use it. I think it's great. <laughs> That's it's awesome. a functional product. Yeah, I'm a fan. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much to the listener. Thank you so much for your time and attention. We really appreciate it. If you love the episode, we would dig a five-star review. And if you didn't like it that much, feel free to stick it to us, but subscribe anyway, because we're going to have a ton of incredible people just like Alex back on the show. Thanks again, Alex. All right. Thanks so much for having me.